Welcome to this podcast for the gospel reading for the baptism of our Lord, Epiphany 1. Uh, it is from Matthew chapter uh, 3, verses 13 to 17. Uh, Matthew's account for series A uh, of the baptism of Jesus. As you notice, you know, we, we just have left the Christmas season with Jesus' birth and then the Epiphany with the, the Magi coming, and all of a sudden we leapfrog forward to the baptism of Jesus, but it is the climactic event of the Epiphany season in the sense of how God is made manifest in the person of the Son, in the person of Jesus, uh, and that's so visibly demonstrated at the baptism of Jesus, where you have the, the full Trinitarian testimony to uh, who Jesus is and what he is about to, to do. Namely, you have uh, the presence of the Father in the voice, uh, and then you have the descending of the Spirit in the dove, as well as the presence of the Son in the flesh in the Jordan River. There's several things to, uh, to keep in mind as you're, as you're preaching this text. Even though this is a very short text, it's very profound in the sense of the connections with the Old Testament. You have a lot of emphasis here of Jesus coming into the Jordan. Keep in mind how Israel uh, had crossed into the promised land and the Jordan. It was sort of that just as they were saved through the Red Sea, then they were saved by being delivered into the promised land on dry ground through the Jordan. Here you have uh, the new Israel, Jesus, coming to save not only Israel but the world by coming into the Jordan. There's some nice typology here. One can say, just as the Ark of the Covenant opened up the way for Israel, now Jesus, as he comes into the Jordan, opens the way of salvation for all of the world. Uh, you have the imagery, too, and this is very important. Um, the most important uh, question, one might say, that people have about why was Jesus baptized? It's the same question that John the Baptist asked. You're coming to me, uh, I should be coming to you. Why do you want to be baptized? And so why is Jesus baptized? I'd like to put that question out right before, as we get started, before we get started and say that it's primarily to take on sin. We are baptized because we're sinners and need sin removed. Jesus, the sinless one, is baptized to take on sin, to become the sin bearer. Keep in mind that right after this event, what happens? He's driven out to the wilderness. Uh, that very much reflects the scapegoat, Leviticus 16, where the sins are placed upon the scapegoat, and the scapegoat then goes and is abandoned to Satan. Jesus becomes the sin bearer in his baptism, and he bears those sins in his earthly ministry he takes on our sin, and he bears it all the way to the cross where he makes the payment for that sin, the atoning sacrifice for that sin, releasing us, releasing the whole world from that sin. So that's an essential question to address in preaching this text, is why was Jesus baptized? He was baptized to take on our sin, uh, very much different than why we are baptized, to have our sin removed through his, his work. Let's get into the Greek text now. We begin at verse uh, 13 uh, here on our board. It's just setting up the, the narrative. Uh, the, the material before this verse is talking about John the Baptist, so now Jesus enters the picture. And you have a present tense uh, verb here, but it's uh, reflecting the fact that it's a historical present. We translate it uh, past. So you have the Jesus uh, coming to be uh, from Galilee, so he's moving from Galilee to the Jordan, namely down to the Jordan River Valley, and this is where John the Baptist had been baptizing. All of that was found in the verses leading up to this text. Uh, to John, so here we're identifying uh, the one who is the other major actor in the baptismal narrative in addition to uh, the persons of the Trinity. You have John playing a very significant role. And then the purpose for which he was coming is brought out by this articular infinitive construction. 
So it's expressing purpose with the article before the infinitive. In order to be baptized, it's a passive um, infinitive. So here you have the agent of the passive activity designated by a hoopa plus the genitive by him, namely by John the Baptist. So Jesus is submitting to the will of God, submitting to having sins placed upon him um, in baptism. He's being baptized by John. Uh, you have verse 14 is this, uh, this verse or this question that are highlighted in the introduction where you have John um, uh, and, and then you have an imperfect verb here uh, was habitually or repeatedly preventing him. Namely, he was putting up a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, barriers to Jesus' request. And this is what he was saying as he was repeatedly or habitually preventing him. Uh, he was saying, and here, beautiful construction. You have the emphatic personal pronouns. I, I have need. And then you have hupa plus the genitive. We saw that same construction. To be by you to be baptized. You have that passive voice and uh, verb again, infinitive. Uh, so I have need to be baptized by you and you uh, are coming to me. So this is the natural question that comes out of the baptismal narrative. People say, why Jesus, the sinless Son of God, is being baptized? And in your proclamation of this, it's so important to bring out the fact that Jesus isn't just being baptized to be an example for us. He's not just being baptized because it's sort of commencing his earthly ministry. He's being baptized in order to fulfill all righteousness. That's the next verse. And that is getting into the atonement theology. He becomes the sin bearer here. And that is brought out nicely in his answer to uh, John. So you have... Jesus answering uh, and saying, he said then to him, namely to John, and you have this uh, yeah. you have this language right here. Uh, he said to him, uh, allow it, uh, allow it uh, now, or allow it to be at the present, uh, namely for me to be baptized. And then this very important verse, and I would say this is a unique part of the baptismal narrative of Matthew, so something that you would want to emphasize a lot in your preaching of this text, that for thus uh, it is fitting, this should be actually in purple, it's a participle, so it's a paraphrastic construction with the verb I, me, plus the participle, for thus it is fitting for us, and here Jesus is including um, John in this salvation history event. It is necessary for us, namely John's playing an important role by being in, this sort, in a sense the priest that puts sin upon Jesus. It's necessary for us to fulfill all righteousness. Now being uh, Lutherans, we really have our antennas go up when we see the Dikaiosune Sunane, uh, that, that noun here. Uh, what is Jesus getting at when he says it is necessary for us to fulfill all righteousness? Uh, basically, um, I think this is a great allusion to a text in Isaiah. And I'll read it. It's Isaiah 53, 11. Uh, and note, we remember how important Isaiah 53 is, the, the suffering servant song. It's actually um, quoted by Matthew, so we know that Matthew has it on his radar. Jesus has it uh, certainly on his self-understanding of his own mission. And verse 11 says, Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, for he shall bear their iniquities." So this emphasis on fulfilling all righteousness is alluding to the fact of how the suffering servant, through bearing the iniquities of all, would, would account uh, all to be righteous. So the fulfilling all righteousness has to do with Jesus becoming now the sin bearer. 
He's the righteous one who obeys in our stead. He is the righteous one who faces Satan, doesn't succumb to the temptation. He's the righteous one who is the perfect sinless one punished for our sins at the cross. All of that can be read out of this, this verse. He is fulfilling all righteousness, not only here at the, at, by, by taking on sin, but all through his earthly ministry. Just to jump ahead, this is one of the reasons why we can, <clears throat> we can understand the statement of the Father. With him I am well pleased. Why is the Father so pleased with the Son? Because he is doing the will of the Father. He is taking upon himself our sin. He who knew no sin became sin for us, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that we might become the righteousness of God. That's really, one might say, being expressed beautifully here in this verse of fulfilling all righteousness. And the Father is pleased with him because of not only what he's doing here, but what he will be doing all through his earthly ministry in, in, in being the righteous one, the obedient one, the true Israel, and then bringing that all to a completion by actually offering, not only being the scapegoat who bears sin, but being the sacrificial goat, Leviticus 16, whose blood is poured out as an atoning sacrifice for sins, as Jesus says in Matthew's institution narrative for the Lord's Supper. Uh, this is the blood of the covenant, uh, Pour, sacrificially poured out for the forgiveness of sin. So that's what we have, uh, you know, a very rich verse here. Uh, and one can say, because Jesus fulfilled all righteousness from his baptism, his earthly ministry, that is the foundation so, for why our baptism can be such a gracious washing of water with the Holy Spirit and bring forgiveness, regeneration, life to us because of what Jesus has done in fulfilling all righteousness. That's why we can have righteousness as a free gift. As Luther says, and we proclaim that so wonderfully in this uh, Reformation 500 year, that uh, we have this alien, perfect righteousness of Christ given uh, graciously, by grace, through Christ, uh, by, uh, by faith. Uh, alone. Okay, uh, going on, then after Jesus says this, then you have this verb again that we saw right up here. Uh, uh, then he allowed him, namely, um, uh, basically, uh, John consented to uh, actually baptize Jesus after Jesus uh, brings this statement in that it is necessary for us, it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then you have the statement of uh, after Jesus was baptized, so you have the participle, uh, then you have immediately, you have um, him coming up on a base, on a bay, coming up from the water, so immediately after he comes out of the water, uh, and then behold, uh, it do there is a signal of something very uh, significant happening. You have uh, here a passive voice verb, the theta, eta, uh, and eris passive. The heavens, namely the realms of God, are opened. This is, I would say, a divine presence. Who's opening them? None other than God himself. It isn't, doesn't mention the agent of the passive activi action, but it's implied God is opening the heavens. This is probably an allusion to Isaiah, where you have this language of uh, in Isaiah 64 that the Lord would render the heavens and come down. It, it, in Jesus, you have the presence of Yahweh coming to deliver his people, a fulfillment of Isaiah 64. So the heavens are, are, are opened uh, and... Then um, he saw, and that's a reference to, uh, to Jesus, he saw the Spirit of God descending uh, as a dove. And so you have the very visible testimony of the presence of the Spirit with the Son. 
The unity of the Trinity is depicted beautifully here in the sense that uh, it's not that, uh, that Jesus didn't have the Spirit, but the presence of the Spirit with Jesus is testified to here in this crucial point in Jesus' uh, ministry, his baptism. And, and the, the, uh, that's testified to all through the, the ministry of Jesus. It's not just the Spirit descended and then was gone. The Spirit is present with Jesus all through his ministry. And this is a vivid testimony to it. Uh, it's just made quite visible with the, um, the descending of the Spirit. Uh, you also have, this is seen as a fulfillment of Isaiah 42, a text that is um, uh, explicitly referenced in Matthew chapter um, uh, 11. You have in Isaiah 42 this testimony, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. That's very much an echo of what the Father says here. I have put my spirit on him and he will bring forth justice. Another way that can be understood is righteousness to the nations. So here again, Jesus is being depicted as that servant of Isaiah, uh, whom the Spirit would be present on. And so this visible action is uh, seen then as fulfilling that which uh, Isaiah wrote about with the servant. So he descends upon a dove and, um, and was um, uh, then uh, verse... Yeah, and, and then he was resting upon him. So he was re remaining there with him, testifying to his presence with him. And then finally, verse 17, you have uh, not only the, the presence of the Son here, the presence of the Spirit, but very vivid testimony to the, to the Father. So this is, one might say, the first and very important testimony to the Trinitarian nature of uh, of uh, the Godhead in Matthew, because you have this very um, uh, uh, concentrated testimony of the presence of the Son, the presence of the Spirit, and then the voice of the Father. Remember, the Father is not seen. The Gospel of John stresses this a lot, but so does Matthew um, in chapter 11. So you have his voice. And, and again, the uh, idu signaling the significance of that uh, his voice comes out of the, the heavens saying, this, namely Jesus, is my son. This can be seen as echoing Psalm 2. Jesus is the Davidic king, but even more than that, he's also the eternal divine son. Uh, so he is the Davidic king. He is the true uh, son uh, in the sense of Israel in one person, but he's also the eternal son, uh, the beloved one. This one might say could echo also the, um, the Isaiah, um, uh, excuse me, not the Isaiah, the Isaac narrative where you have Abraham's beloved son is willing to be sacrificed. Here the father is pointing to that one who would be sacrificed in, in when, the, when in Isaiah, excuse me, in Genesis 22, when it said the Lord will provide, this is the final beloved son that God provides, his own son. Uh, and he spares Isaac, the beloved son of Abraham. Uh, so this is my son, my beloved him, one in whom I am well pleased. You have that relative pronoun, the well pleased. Why? Because he fulfills all righteousness. He takes on sin here. We're plunged under the waters to be washed of our sin because of Jesus being plunged under the waters to take on sin. And what a joyous exchange that Jesus took on our sin at his baptism and, and bore it to the cross and paid for it so that now we can be plunged under the waters and come up with, with his righteousness, come up forgiven, come up freed from our sins, and that God, because of the, this beloved Son, can say to us, you are my beloved Son. In the person of the Son, we are beloved ones, beloved sons of God. And that's an important application to make as you're proclaiming this, is to direct 
people then to their own baptism and the blessings they have received because of Jesus' baptism and its foundation and power for our own uh, gracious washing in holy baptism. May the Lord bless your proclamation of this wonderful epiphany text uh, in the week ahead.